you may think the ending of Hazard and Dragon 2 was the final time we see Drago Bloodvist. And you be... Correct! Case closed! Create! Upload! Video! He drowns off the shores of Berk. But in the production of House of Train Dragon 3, Drago was meant to return. They were going to develop his character more, other than being the big screamy man, and get confirmation on how he would meet his ultimate demise. Wow, building on top of what we have established? How great! Who's this middle-aged tosser with a giant mouth? Yeah, one of the studio's notes was to completely axe Drago and introduce a new villain instead. Now, I'm not saying this was a good or a bad decision, because House of Dragon 3 is completely amazing. <laughs> it's just giving additional context to the fate of Drago. Because not gonna lie, myself and I think many other Dragon fans kind of found it a little underwhelming. Drago did significantly impact the world building, capturing dragons from around the archipelago and displacing a lot of people and tribes which was further explored in Serpent's Air. So Drago is no longer in House Train Dragon 3, so what actually happened to him? Surely a bit of water in the lungs shouldn't stop a beast of a man. What an alpha male. Well, in the fire tides, we get all the juicy details. Fuck! That hashtag is looking mighty appetizing. No. But wait. There's more. In a series of unlikely cosmic events, the universe has bestowed upon us a gift. Unpacking the unreleased How to Train Dragon comic, The Fire Tides, with Richard Hamilton. Hello, f you, ya! Yeah. You crazy son of a bitch, you're dead. Audrey interviewed the great Richard Hamilton, telling us the contents of the story in The Fire Tides. Now, I feel I should give a bit of context and a background behind these series of comics and this godly man. The comics The Serpent Hair, Dragon Vine, and The Fire Tides are a set of three comics that were set between How to Train Dragon 2 and How to Train Dragon 3. Exactly what I wanted from a series, instead of this garbage. These give more details and world building after a major impact from Drago. More on Hiccup's decisions, which led to the state of Burke in the Hidden World, and the cars properly grieving over Stoic. And Hiccup actually coming in terms with becoming the chef. Chef? A meds type chief, which would be a massive career change. And uh, get this, these set of comics are written by Dean. You know, the director of all the House of Dragon films. So it's definitely up there in the canon material. Richard Hamilton? He is also the writer of these comics. He's also wrote some other things, like uh, Dragon's The Dawn of New Riders game, and the VR interactive experience? <laughs> uh, kinda wanna test that out. But yeah, he also did, I think, assist in the writing process of House of Train Dragon 2 as well, so... I think it's important for fans to know that you really worked your way up the ladder at DreamWorks. It wasn't like you just got hired on as a writer. Didn't you actually start working at DreamWorks as a receptionist? not even a receptionist, a temp receptionist. Um, <laughs> basically, at that point in my life, all I had to my name was a master's degree in screenwriting. And I had a comic book self-publishing company. And neither of those things were super popular at the time. I couldn't get arrested in this town. I couldn't get hired anywhere. And so I thought, well, I better start um, temping to just kind of get my foot in the door and then maybe I could just prove myself. And um, I had some downtime, so I would walk the halls and on the, um, it was the second floor of the Riverside building, I saw the first images of How to Train Dragon 1. And there are these big boards that they'd use for, for pitch meetings. And I saw the lineups of the characters and I saw Nico Marley's drawings. And I saw that basically like half the cast of Superbad was doing the voices. I'm like, this looks incredible. This looks like a movie I would want to see. You know, next few months I kept getting brought back for different temp jobs and then I uh, finally got to temp for one week for one of the associate producers on Dragon One and that's when I got to see a lot of good stuff and this was before Chris and Dean came on as directors um, so uh, it was really kind of neat to see that earlier version of it and then compare it to the one we all know about. Yeah, um, and, and Dean is really um, very much to thank for that. Um, so I, I worked my way up. I eventually got to be hired on full time as an assistant to um, the chief creative officer. He was a guy named Bill Maschke, really great guy. He really championed the first dragon and Chris Sanders and Dean Deblois as the writer directors of it. Anyway, it, it wound up that um, I've been working for Bill for probably about three years and I, maybe he was getting a little sick of me and he's like, you know, 
Dean's looking for uh, an assistant and a, a script coordinator in Dragon 2, and I think it'd be a good fit for you. And uh, yeah, so then I, I got to make the transition over to the Dragon 2 crew, and I, I interviewed with him for this job to be his assistant and the script coordinator. Not even a minute after that, we just started talking about comics, and he was saying, hey, he was a big fan of Conan comics, and, and I just sort of had this fantasy back then no, oh, it'd be kind of cool if maybe one day Dean and I got to make Dragon comics together, not knowing that a few years later that's exactly what we'd be doing. Sorry for the long clip, but I really wanted to show his journey and his background with Dragons in his own words. Yeah, he's pretty much been there since the beginning, and he's worked closely with Dean for many years. Anything this man says is canon. Now we have the context of what's going on. Without further ado, let's see what truly happened to Drago Bloodvist. It was before we get to the whole opening, we would see a scene very much like Forbidden Friendship from the first Dragon movie. It's mostly in silhouette, but it's a night fury, only it's not toothless. And there's a, a young hand reaching out, and it, but it's not Hiccup's hand. It's a, it's a boy in another village very far from the archipelago, and it's in the night fury. This night fury has been mistreated. We see it's all scarred. It's been trapped and it's broken out of traps and behind this boy, is this whole sort of village of warriors and he's trying to tame the dragon while the rest of the village is trying to kill him. And the dragon is so freaked out, it attacks the boy and it, it bites his arm. We find out this was young Drago. And oh so it's a flashback God. explaining why he's particularly taken with, with Night Furies, the import that they have on him and how he was traumatized at a really young age and that informed his worldview now. This is great, uh, it gives more motivation behind the character. Uh, you know, why would he have such a vendetta against Hiccup and the Night Fury? So it gives additional motivation from How to Train Dragon 2. But also, it does kind of sound a little bit like Rimmel. So I guess they kind of borrowed that story and gave it to him instead. Also, we will see another bloody Night Fury, which we have never done. Complicating things a little bit though, in, in the ruins, we find out that um, Hiccup and Toothless aren't alone under there. It turns out a few months ago, um, the Fathom Finn uh, found another castaway at sea and brought this castaway back to these very same ruins. And this castaway is Drago, Bloodvist. And this is where we would finally uh, kind of close the loop. So it turns out Drago was taken to underwater ruins by the Fathom Finn, which is a cool dragon, and I'd like to delve into it more one day. And so we'd, we'd get into what, what Drago's been up to, and, and he did lose that arm, but he does have kind of a new appendage. And this is the other new dragon for this book, and that's the Tormentipede. And um, it is basically a giant centipede-looking dragon, but its back legs have attached itself to Drago's um, stump, and it now functions as sort of like a new prosthetic arm one that can shoot fire and do all kinds of other crazy stuff. That's such a unique dragon idea, and I would love to see this. If you've drawn this, please tweet this at me. I really want to see fan art of this. Also, Tormentipede. I wonder if it's related to Thunderpede in any way. It was gonna be pretty brutal between Drago and Hiccup and Toothless, and, and Hiccup and Toothless are, again, it's close confines. If Toothless does a big plasma blast, it could bring down the entire ocean on top of them. So they have to get sort of very clever, very MacGyvery around there. Um, and, and it's sort of like a game of cat and mouse with Drago hunting them there. And Drago's saying, we're, we're ending this and, and only one of us is leaving this sunken ruins and it's gonna be near, it's gonna be you and you're gonna have to fight for your life. And Hiccup is a pacifist. And so again, we're sort of getting into the question of what, what kind of chief is he? What kind of legacy is he carrying for his dad, who's an incredible fighter? What does this mean for him as, as, as a point of faith? You know, Hiccup's existence is about nonviolence and pacifism and, and turning the other cheek and finding another way. But if he doesn't fight now, he won't live to be able to protect the rest of his, his um, tribe and you know see Astrid again or his mom again so he has to fight. It would have been a real um, a real struggle in every sense of the term for Hiccup and it would be a really kind of dark midnight of the soul sort of thing where he's having to, to examine his own capacity for violence even in, in the form of self-defense and what that means for him and, and his faith as a, as a young Viking and a young human being and a young leader. Man, this aspect of Hiccup I would love to be explored more. It informs most of his decisions as the chief. That's why he runs instead of fights. But really questioning and challenging his beliefs is a fantastic direction to look at, considering Hiccup's character has been fairly fleshed out at this point. 
in the course of sort of this cat and mouse around the island um, and the fact that Drago has this uh, new arm that can breathe fire, um, Hiccup is like, I need, I need to armor up. And his flight suit, his original one from D2, got trashed in Dragonvine. This is where we would see him first taking some of Toothless's scales and grinding them up and making them into a fireproof. Um, it wouldn't be armor, but he was going to sort of wear it as camouflage. Classic hiccup ingenuity there. I can literally imagine the moment where he figures it out. But I also love the progression. It's not just a wham, bam, armor dragon suit. It starts off as camo, then would resist the fire from the Tormentipede, and then the combination of the wingsuit from Dragons 2. Ugh, perfect. So there's the big battle, um, uh, and and it, it all goes down, and, and I won't, you know, I still hold that hope that the Fire Tides graphic novel will come out in some fashion in, in some way in some year. Um, but um, Drago does get a very very uh, final fate where it's very clear what happens to him and I'll just say that Drago is not the one who leaves the uh, ruins it's uh, Hiccup and Toothless who do and um, but it, it you know it, it cost Hiccup a little piece of his soul you know he had to do the thing that he said he wouldn't in Dragon 2 but he, he had to do it because there was so much riding on his survival and that's part of being the chief. Hiccup kills Drago? Well, that's my theory anyways, judging by the wording from Richard. But again, I would love to see this fight, especially as it escalates. With the Fathom Fin blowing air into the ruins, powering up the firepower of the Tormentipede, because of oxygen. But the challenge of doing what's necessary for himself and for Birkians, conflicting with Hiccup's personal morals of pacifism. That is how he writes a compelling narrative and conflict. If that element was included in How to Train Dragon 2, and let's be honest, most of it was set up. Let's go find him and change his mind. Oh, some minds won't be changed, Hiccup. Honestly, a couple more lines of dialogue, or replace some, would seamlessly integrate this conflict into the film, building a stronger antagonist in Drago and more growth for Hiccup leading into the third movie. It sort of goes without saying that you should definitely watch the full interview. You'll get much more about behind the scenes of the franchise and more story from the Fire Tides. Like the new dragon species, well two actually. I would eventually do videos on them, which I'm, I'm excited about. I will, I will look at them. We see how they made the dragon suits, and sweet, sweet shirtless hiccup. Oh yeah, Audrey and Richard are hosting a competition to draw shirtless hiccup, which you should totally enter, but you may have to compete against me. Do it now. That's everything. We now know what happens to Drago. He doesn't just flail in the water and sinks to the bottom. We always sort of did think he surely should come back in some meaningful way. Can't just give up like that. <laughs> so now we do. And, it, and I love the fact that it's a more of a personal fight between Hiccup and Drago this time. One on one, mostly. Kind of two on two. They've both got dragons which, with limiting stuff they could do. <laughs> but at this point, I'm just rambling. So if you enjoyed the video, thank you for watching. Um, TTFN. Ta-ta for now.